Here we go. Um, cool. Here we go. Have fun, everyone. Cool. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today presented by the National Health Executive in partnership with SAS Software. Um, so this webinar will be focusing on earlier and faster diagnostics with AI analytics and health data working hand in hand to improve care and innovation. Um, my name's Jack. I will um, temporarily host this event whilst um, Adam tries to get on. Uh, he's just experienced a few technical difficulties. Um, so Adam is the head of category for digital IT at NHS Shared Business Services. Um, and he'll be with us in a minute, like I say. So this webinar is hosted by the National Health Executive in partnership with SAS Software. And we will be discussing how AI and advanced analytics can provide accurate and fast treatment while saving lives, utilizing both statistical and real-time data. Um, so given the unique pressures that hospitals currently face, um, we will be discussing how the NHS can implement AI and advanced analytics to reduce current pressures, including bed locking, staff shortages, patient outcomes, and how it will increase public confidence, patient and improve innovation in hospitals that that can help staff optimization and retention so the national health executive is always keen to deliver content that contributes to innovation across the nhs um, and today's discussions will be full of opportunities for not just our panelists to express their thoughts and opinions but for you guys as well um, so if you want to get more please ask me now. Do an and also get involved on the live chat as well um, so it, Please put them forward if you'd like um, a specific panelist to answer those questions. Um, please pop their name on on the question just before the actual question itself. Um, so with that, let's bring on our panelists into this conversation. We have Morton Croth Danielson, uh, customer advisor health for healthcare at SAS Software. Dr. Matt Anada Kim, consultant in acute medicine for Hampshire Hospitals. Elaine Gillian. Black Country and West Birmingham Systems Program Lead for Diagnostics and Community Diagnostics. Di Eleanor Provenzano, Consultant Histopathologist at Cambridge University, and Ivan Bransland, MD, DMSC Professor at the University of South Southern Denmark and Lily Bell Hospital. Um, so thank you everyone for giving your time today. Let me just pop you onto our main stage. Um, I'll pop everyone across now. Um, so I'll give you a quick, oh, sorry, I should really have myself. <laughs> so yeah, um, if you guys, um, starting with yourself, Morton, if that's all right, uh, just quickly give, give yourselves an introduction. Um, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My name is uh, Morton Cole Danielson. I've been at SES for 15 years. Before I joined SES, I worked at a hospital in Denmark where I was responsible for IT, HR, and finance. And now I'm covering uh, Danish and Nordic hospitals and supporting top management at hospitals, bringing AI into their hospitals. And uh, have been working closely together with Ian Brandslund and the Lillebelt Hospital uh, for, for several years. Fantastic. Um, Elena? Hi, I'm, I'm Eleanor Provenzano. I'm lead breast pathologist um, at Adam Brooks Hospital here in Cambridge. So I am sort of um, oversee the diagnostic service and I'm involved in the implementation of our digital pathology program here, along with um, some of my colleagues, including Rebecca Brace, um, involved in a lot of clinical trial research as well, um, including some AI based research. Fantastic. Um, Matt? Um, hi everyone. I'm a I'm Matt and Kim. I'm a consultant in acute medicine and a professor in clinical experimental science at the University of Southampton. I'm national clinical director for infection antimicrobial resistance and deterioration, and I work on um, integrated healthcare solutions using digital tech, um, such as COVID oximetry programs. Um, that have done a lot of um, work in AI-based systems to do with clinical care and um, the support of patients. Amazing. Um, Elaine? Hello, everyone. My name is Elaine Gilliland. I'm system lead for the Black Country and I cover diagnostics and the development of community diagnostic centres for the Black Country system. Um, I'm involved in 
AI in uh, diagnostics uh, significantly in uh, implementing new technologies in the development of uh, community diagnostic centres, um, clinical decision support and IA for teledermatology at the moment. Fantastic. And Ivan? And I'm uh, Ivan Branslow and I'm... I'm Ivan, a, sorry, apologies. I'm a laboratory director for many years and uh, I have been a doctor for almost 50 years and during the last uh, five years I have worked with Morton on uh, development of uh, artificial intelligence systems, especially within uh, cancer calculation at general practitioners, but also at, uh, yeah. for uh, emergency reception patients um, in my hospital, where we have uh, around 50,000 emergency received patients per year. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for giving up your time today. Um, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll have a, a really good discussion. So. Um, Morton, I'd like to start off with you, if that's all right. So um, how can AI in healthcare help the NHS increase productivity, optimize resources, reduce mortality, and improve patient outcomes? I think if we start looking at the, the world and the, our hospital systems across countries, we see the same uh, pains, the same challenges for all hospitals. We are having a growing elderly population. We are having more chronic uh, patients and we are having a lot of patients with comorbidities. So that brings a lot of pressure on our hospital system. So we simply need to do, change the way that we innovate and the, train, the way that we bring new technologies into our hospital. And this desert, which is the, our fast diagnostics, which is developed between SAS and the Little Belt hospitals, that, that's actually where we are having the purpose of coming up with 18 outcomes within 60 minutes based on, on biomarkers. And that's an example on how it will be possible for a hospital to, to change the way that they actually operate. Uh, I don't know even if you have anything to add on that. No, except that um, uh, we, when, we, when we started all, all this, we followed the lipid Nostra model to uh, get everything and in place for doing this because uh, you have to have all the conditions right, especially a laboratory that actually can do a very large repertoire of testing within 60 minutes. And we have achieved that through a uh, program of robotization and automation during the last 10 to 12 years. Fantastic. Uh, that's really, really good. Good stuff. Um, so uh, Elaine, Eleanor, Matt, the do you have anything to bring in onto that conversation? Yeah, I mean, um, so a good example of, I, I guess, using the power of AI is what we're doing from the infections program. So we're trying to develop a trusted research environment to pull together the entire population of England into a database and then look at the um, incidence of infection within that population um, and then the various uh, clues for severe outcomes, good outcomes, in their genotype and phenotype, um, i.e. their presenting conditions, their comorbidities, their background, how they present, what tests were done and when they were done, what treatments they received, and then tracking those outcomes against every single one of the population members over time to create a database that will enable us to answer the questions as to what severe infection is, who needs to see a doctor and receive antibiotic treatment, who does not, who has sepsis, who doesn't, how much cost is there? What will save money? What will save lives? And that um, sort of illustration of using the power of a population database and then to leave AI to solve the problems and questions or come up with even the questions that need to be asked is a really tantalizing prospect. And one, um, unfortunately, COVID has got in the way of. But hopefully, we are now in a position to move forward on. I'm sure you guys are massively back on track with, the, with, the, with everything diagnostics wise. And so, um, AI will definitely be plowing forward with that. Um, so Elaine, if you've got anything to join in with that one. I think, um, yeah, I think it's really important to um, think about productivity and efficiency around referral management and how AI can support that as well. Um, releasing um, some uh, administrative burdens um, and going forward, this is going to have a huge impact on 
job roles and what the clinicians can then utilize their time to do. I think there is a big fear around uh, um, job replacement with AI, but it's not. It's a different set of skills needed going forward. So it's around ensuring that our clinicians are um, lit have literacy around AI and how it's going to improve rather than impact on them going um, the implementation of things like clinical decision software and imaging, uh, image recognition it is vital going forward. It's going to have such a big in impact on uh, efficiency and productivity going forward. Um, yeah, I, I guess taking forward what um, Elaine was saying, I sort of um, mainly work within the breast screening program and we have huge workforce shortages at the moment, particularly in diagnostic services such as radiology and, and pathology. And I think what AI can do is, you know, at the moment, um, some centres have backlogs of, of cases because they can't get through the work and AI can sort of um, screen cases, um, identify cases that have a high likelihood of cancer and those cases can then be prioritised to make sure that we're sort of um, reducing our, our turnaround times for, for cancer diagnostics. Um, and in terms of efficiency, so with a, a breast biopsy, what I need to do is I need to look at it, is there cancer or not, order additional tests. And there are AI algorithms available that will screen that biopsy, say the likelihood of a cancer being present. If a cancer is present, it will order the additional tests that are required. So as a pathologist, I then have the, the finished product delivered to me. So it's not gonna replace me or what I do. It's, I'm still the person making the final decision, but it will just allow huge efficiency gains in a, in a situation where we've got a very sort of um, short staffed workforce. And I suppose every, um, the whole recruitment side of thing is a, a massive part of that as well. So that's really interesting to know. Um, so Eleanor, going to you. Um, so how do you think AI will improve those clinical pathways for patients with cancer? Um, so I guess I've already mentioned at the moment, you know, we've got a yeah. workforce shortages, we've, we've got backlogs. And what these algorithms can do is they can screen the slide, identify the cases that are most likely to contain cancer. So those cases can, can then be prioritised. Um, it also acts as a quality control check. So as I mentioned, the pathologist is still the person making the final decision, but what it will do is it will highlight hotspots. Um, so we can sort of, um, we, we screen a slide initially and then the algorithm identifies a hotspot, we can go back and, and review it again. So it's an additional quality check just to make sure that the diagnoses aren't, um, aren't missed. So I think it's going to, to sort of stream, streamline the process, um, reduce turnaround times potentially, but also act as a quality control step um, and improve accuracy in diagnosis. Fantastic. That's really, really good. Um, anybody have, have any opinions on, on Eleanor's answer and question? Yeah, from a clinical pathways perspective, I think she's right on the money. We, we don't have enough clinicians to serve the needs of the population at the moment. We certainly don't have enough funding. Um, and um, we, we need people working at the top of their level, non-healthcare clinicians, to support clinical work. And that includes AI. So at the moment we have a huge amount of algorithms and pathways we're putting in place for non-clinicians to assist clinical decision making, uh, both in the one-on-one -on -one service. GP reception is a good example. And the question is, what, what if we can automate some of those processes and derive an artificial intelligence-based algorithm to ensure the right decision is made without potentially involving a human being? We've attempted this with one-on-one -on -one services, with various decision um, algorithms online that patients or the general public can access, with very limited success and very huge gaping holes in terms of the outcomes for those patients. And the question is what we can do to move on beyond the current level of quality and safety and, and what we can actually do to ensure that the right patient is seen by the right person in the right place at the right time with the right treatments and the right interventions. And this is where population level data will really help us. So suddenly, if we have that, as Eleanor says, we will be seeing the right patient more often. And instead of a 2% hit rate for cancer in a two week wait clinic, suddenly we might get closer to 20 or 30%. We will actually provide better effective use of the most valuable resource in healthcare, which is time. Maybe, maybe I can add, add that uh, you have uh, 
pinpointed some of the uh, key words here, namely quality, safety, uh, speed, turnaround time, um, less uh, need for hands-on, and that's very important with AI. Of course, some people are afraid of their jobs, losing their jobs and so on, but that's not the problem for the, uh, for the healthcare sector at the moment. The, the problem is that we don't have hands enough, so, so the more we can robotize and automate and uh, use artificial intelligence, the fewer hands we will need. And our doctors in the emergency reception uh, wards are very overburdened at the moment. So we need to release them and relieve them by artificial intelligence. When we started this, they were very afraid of losing their job. But we, they were told, well, you are relieved. You are not going to lose your job. You're just going to, some, to do something else and faster. Because that is very important. We have achieved a very short turnaround time for evaluation of patients in our emergency research to help the uh, young doctors because, as I told them, well, artificial intelligence has been pro proven to be able to beat the world champion in chess. Don't you think they are a bit better than a average physician in the middle of the night at two o'clock uh, receiving a, a, a life-threatened patient? Of course it is, and it has been shown, and we have shown it in this work where we reach um, um, areas under the curve for detecting sepsis, predicting risk of death uh, with AU AUCs between 20 and 95 percent. And I'm quite sure that a doctor usually will be between 70 and 80 percent. So, so uh, you, we, we, uh, we actually have to apply artificial intelligence because it works. Jack, could I come in there? I think it's really important to pick up on the um, data quality um, issue that we have within healthcare uh, and making sure that we we cleanse the, the data we have and we're using the right da data um, to get this into um, uh, AI sourcing the right data at the right time. Um, and the other thing that I want to pick up on is the education of both clinical and non-clinical staff around AI. I don't think we offer that enough at the moment. So how do we incorporate that into our training syllabuses um, and the education going forward as well? Um, and I think we really need to focus on um, the innovators uh, of our future uh, in AI and how we, we incorporate those into healthcare. Brilliant. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I've just seen that Adam's popped up as well. Um, so brilliant. Thank you for getting on, Adam. That's, that's absolutely perfect. Um, I will. Uh, can, can you hear me well? And can we hear you? Hopefully we can. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Apologies for the lateness. No, no, no problem at all. Um, tell you what, I will leave you guys um, in the capable hands of Adam. Thank you for having me. Jack. Um, Jack, yeah, sorry, I think it's best to stay on because I, I don't yeah. know which questions you've asked and which you haven't. So no, that's is that absolutely okay fine. If you continue. Absolutely fine. Um, so, yeah, you. do you have anything to add on what what everyone else has been saying there? Can I come in? Because I just wanted to support what Elaine's just said about data quality and in is proportional to data quality out. Absolutely right. And um, unfortunately, not all of our systems, if if we're honest, are fit for purpose in terms of that data quality. We have to engage and educate, as Elaine said, about the importance of inputting accurate data in the first place. And that, that in part, is part of the educational process, because only once we get that part out will the AI outputs be of higher quality. Um, I think we also have to resolve the, resolve the governance question and where risk lies in the system, in the minds of clinicians, if AI-based systems are telling clinicians one thing as Ivan says, if you've got an ORUC of 90 to 95 percent, very difficult to argue against that. Um, the, the question is if, if you have an experienced clinician who does argue against that, and in their judgment, it, this is not the right call for a patient, who's right? And who medico-legally is right if that patient comes to harm and there is a, an audit trail of the AI system telling the said clinician that they should have gone down pathway A instead of pathway B? And the patient ends up dying. So this is these are really difficult questions that need to be teased out 
in terms of how the decision making is documented and who has right of 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 control over the patient's pathway um it'd be interesting to discuss this if there is time 100 maybe maybe i can add uh, that we have we are working on that and when we started the dessert project which is diagnostic expert systems enter real time that's actually not diagnostic expert system it's a support system it's a safety net for the clinicians to support him but he still has the decision but but of course uh, uh, we need uh, safety uh, and we need the the right data and when we started this we uh, we, we wanted to be sure that we had high quality data and that's why we didn't use um, um, observational data from clinicians because they are unreliable. We mostly or only used uh, biomarkers which are uh, which are made were made just one hour before exactly when the patient arrived. We know the quality of that of these markers and we have actually now investigated how the Education of patients will change with lower quality. So we have a new quality um, focus here and a new quality problem because AI will actually uh, decide what quality is needed for the input data. They have to be very reliable. We have tried it on the MELT score for liver transplantation and it seems that just, uh, just uh, uh, getting a coefficient of variation or bias of more than three to four uh, percent uh, in chains will uh, will classify, reclassify patients up to five percent of kids. That's very critical, and that's how it is. So, so we are actually writing up a paper about it now in the Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine Journal to to make folk aware, to make people aware of this problem uh, that they need the right data and reliable data with the same quality as the site that actually developed the artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm. Fantastic. No, thank you. Fantastic, Ivan. Um, really great and answer. even uh, maybe I can add that that's Definitely actually more a part of our governance. When we are driving a project with a hospital, I would say 70% of the time is actually used on the data part. It's not doing the modeling, of course, it's difficult, but it's actually ensuring that you are having the right data and you also are having the uh, capability to have data in real time if, if fast, if speed is important. So never us, uh, underestimate this uh, data part. And I, 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 I have to add there that uh, we, have, uh, we have speeded up the whole process by inventing the tempo system which will bring all samples from everywhere to the lab in 30 seconds. This means that we can process uh, and do more than 220 analytical tests within 60 minutes and put it on the uh, SAS via platform uh, to, uh, to estimate an uh, algorithm and outcomes for 18 different diseases and uh, risk uh, levels. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, really important. Brilliant. No, that's some really great answers there. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'd like to move it on to um, to um, to Elaine, if possible. Um, so I just kind of want to know who owns those risks of implementation. I, I know Ivan, you were saying how like implementing, especially with the SaaS software, it, it works so well. Um, so what what are those? What can be those risks? really important to pick up um, that clinicians are still quite risk averse to um, implementing AI, um, but they're not necessarily the people who are performance management of uh, tr trusts and, uh, and also they don't necessarily see the benefits of AI implementation, especially with regards to triaging, because they don't see those numbers that are um, productively and efficiently um, being sourced through the triaging process. So they don't necessarily feel the pain of what's going on in the background. Um, so there's sometimes barriers to implementation through the clinicians actually saying we don't trust this we don't have the evidence behind it 
So we need to overcome that by it being driven from someone who recognizes the performance management, the performance data requirements, um, and those drivers for the NHS um, to increase our productivity with a lack of workforce. So the question is, who owns that risk? Is it the CMO? How do we drive it going forward? Um, and we have to be really intelligent about um, who owns the risk and take that away from with regards to the implementation of AI as a whole, but still allow the clinicians to own the um, the process, if that makes sense. No, definitely. Um, Adam, to bring you in, into the conversation, actually, I think Ivan's got a really good, about to make a point, so <laughs> go for it. Can, can I can I comment on yeah. that? No, definitely. Because, of course, uh, the big problem here in artificial intelligence is disagreement between between a very experienced and good doctor and an, an AI system. That's that's the problem. And what we have tried to solve this is first and foremost to cooperate with our clinicians and uh, uh, and actually reduce the number of variables we use without losing area under the curve. So we have reduced, there is a lot of noise from somewhere. Uh, we have reduced the uh, number of, um, of uh, variables, 140 used in our project, 75. Uh, and further, we have been able to uh, tell the doctor if he questions the uh, artificial intelligence area under the curve decision um, we have we, we are able to tell him what actually decides what is the deci decisive variable that determines this outcome or this risk so he can discuss it with himself whether he believes in this outcome this value this is called SHAP uh, diagrams yeah that goes yeah. for it yeah, so, I mean, I think this has got to be led by the clinicians. No one else can lead it um, in terms of that responsibility for patients' lives and actually that decision-making in tandem with judgment. The artificial way um, AI systems are constructed is not are not always helpful in terms of real-life blood and guts medicine. Um, AI is fantastic if you've got every single result you need and every single bit of um, documentation dotted within your clinical record and within your trusted research environment. The real world is far messier. We're lucky if we have two thirds of that information in real life. And the chasm and gap between an area under the receiver operating curve of 95% when you have everything back compared to what happens when you have two thirds of the information back actually favors the clinician. Um, and I think there's a few papers that have been done to prove that um, over time. So I think there's a certain amount of balance in terms of the merits of AI, and we need to be really honest about the limitations of AI at the same time. If we keep egg egging on about how good it is, no one's going to listen. If we keep driving this from the top instead of the bottom, no one's going to listen. This has got to be properly led by clinicians, and that involves um, obtaining, I guess, trust from clinicians in terms of their um, co-design and co-development of these systems in tandem with clinical judgment with the right questions being asked around clinical risk governance and litigation going forward and then addressing all of the concerns that I think Elaine brought up in terms of education um, and then the quality of data thereafter. So this is about a partnership, a collaboration, a relationship and of not doing things to people but those people very much being part of the creative and developmental process. Eleanor, I can see you're, you're eager to get in there. Yeah, I was, I was going to jump in at the same time, um, answer one of the questions that's been posted on the chat by Nicola Curry, because she also mentions about um, some of the things we've been discussing around sensitivity and, and specificity and quality assurance. So um, I know that the trial we're about to, to set out with is really looking at efficiency with the NHS, but we're using an, an algorithm um, called Ibex Galen, um, which has been, you know, was developed over a huge cohort of over 100,000 cases. 
has been extensively um, validated in, in clinical settings in, in different countries um, and it has sort of a, a CE marking but even then this multi-centre trial we're about to set out on is the first time it's being implemented in the NHS and I think from a quality assurance perspective these tools really initially need to be introduced in a, a controlled manner in the sort of um, setting of, of, of trials where there's quite strict oversight and, and quality assurance um, looking at the outcomes. Obviously in the screening program, we have very strict uh, quality assurance um, guidelines and I think they need to be followed to sort of to sort of provide those reassurances both for the patients and also for the, the clinicians to sort of validate these tools in an, an NHS setting before they're sort of um, rolled out for more general use. Definitely. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to move it on if we can. That was some fantastic answers. Great, great discussion between you guys there. It was really good. Um, so I'd like to bring it back to uh, Morton, if that's OK. Um, so where else do you see biomarker diagnostics supporting clinicians across primary and secondary care? <laughs> uh, I think that our projects at the Lillibelt Hospital shows that if it's important for a project to have very uh, secure and high quality data, then you need to, to focus on the data produced in the lab. Uh, so actually, I think that we will be having, uh, and we are already having, uh, several projects where we are using biomarkers, for instance, for in the oncology department, and also regarding risk of uh, before going into coloscopy. So, so there is a lot of different uh, purposes of using uh, biomarkers uh, and I think it's what we see is that actually that when you are having access to these data and now we are having a great uh, database uh, where biomarkers is the primary data source you can have uh, projects up and running very fast if you are having the right organization around your data so uh, so biomarkers is uh, very important but we, we need to discuss the, the organization around data. So uh, people and competences and of course technology and processes are, are very important. Uh, but uh, I think biomarkers and all data produced in a lab will be, the, be very, very important for, for coming AI projects. Brilliant. Um, Ivan, um, if you'd like to join yeah, in on that one. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could add there. That I could add there that started uh, using the lab uh, results from uh, 23 different biochemical and and different tests being done uh, in general practice for patient on patients that the GP suspected uh, could have a uh, a cancer, and we were actually able to uh, clarify and calculate the risk for the single patient. And that is something that we should be very aware of, that if we want to use data, they should all be as complete as possible. And uh, we have achieved in our big data, in, in our big uh, dessert project, uh, that 99% uh, of our variable data is present after uh, one hour. If you rely on other data from uh, from us and from electronic patient journals they are not they are not reliable and therefore we did not rely on too many observational data done by clinicians because they are not trained they are not disciplined they they report heights weights and blood pressure in around 100 different ways which is difficult to handle in an ai system you need very uh, strict formulated uh, data and uh, th therefore we focused on using laboratory data which were quality control and all for the single patient there's a big difference in doing a ai project in 100,000 patients and finding aucs and so on uh, and going from there and to use it on the single patient the single patient need a high security and um, in the single risk calculation and that is 
we have to focus more on that in the future. We are writing a couple of papers on, on that problem right now. Amazing. Um, does anybody have else have anything to kind of add on why biomarkers kind of lend themselves to early diagnostics at all? Or any opinions on that? I think they with care, out? they have um, a potential place in this, but you need the clinical screening and you need to ensure you're doing them on the right patient. We don't do biomarkers on every single one of the 60 million patients or people in the population. There has to be um, an element of clinical judgment to decide who requires the test in the first place and in what setting and when. And um, although biomarkers are good within a specific cohort, for instance, presenting to critical care with extreme physiological derangement, the question is what they actually mean in the context of very generalized symptoms or non-specific symptoms, or indeed a relatively well patient, because the trials have not been done on biomarkers within very well people who don't have anything to do with that particular condition often in, um, in, in large scale studies. So um, context is everything here. And um, though there is huge merit of the AI based system and biomarkers specifically, it needs to be taken with a pinch of salt and against the backdrop of the economic harms of expensive cutting edge tests and the benefits as well as the risks. I, I agree totally. Uh, what we actually found was also that uh, our next problem and uh, next step is to find better markers, right markers, better markers. At, and when you use artificial intelligence, it will be disclosed actually that your, if your variables are not good enough and some are redundant and some show the same thing and so on. So. Uh, uh, at the same time, AI can be used to actually evaluate the markers you use for their fit for purpose. But yeah. you're absolutely it also, right. Sorry. It also comes back to the squeeze on funding uh, and making a, a very real decision uh, around what's appropriate and what's inappropriate going forward for um, improvements, productivity and efficiency. Um, we are being told, you know, that we have to uh, be more efficient, more productive. AI is going to support with that, but we've got to make the right decisions on what we incorporate and what we don't. So um, biomarkers going forward will be perfect in an idea world where we had lot, lots of funding coming forward, but we need to, again, I pick up with what Matt said, make the right decisions on what we're bringing into the NHS at this point. Brilliant, amazing, thank you guys. Um, yeah, really some really good answers and to you guys um, watching as well, you're sending in a lot of questions, so um, I'm, I might dive into that if that's okay with you guys. Um, I just want to bring it back to the topic before I did actually see a really good question and now it's completely gone. Um, so I was going to bring it back, um, but I'm not going to now. Um, bear with me two seconds. Gone. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. Um, so how can AI be used, uh, utilized for predicting missed appointments to assist healthcare providers to target them ahead of the appointments? I think we spoke about this a little bit um, in, during the recruitment Part, part of this this webinar uh, it would just be good to get it that's from molly das solu if anybody's got any opinions on that well well um well one of the reasons why we want to use ai and base it on observations or the patient's um, um, data or the patient's answers and and of course uh, variables um, biochemical markers was that we wanted to diagnose by or triage the patients in their yeah. home and we already uh, um, medical doctors visiting patients who call the emergency reception and ask for help uh, to go there and and take samples and uh, test the patient and we want to actually apply these uh, blood samples uh, to artificial intelligence by bringing these blood samples directly to the lab and 
process them within an hour to uh, classify the patient's uh, risk in um, in terms of uh, uh, survival and uh, risk of uh, sepsis and so on. Uh, this has just been started, but we can see now from our dessert project that we uh, can actually do specific we can ask specific questions uh, for diseases and serious uh, conditions uh, just by very few using very so uh, this is our next step uh, because that will relieve the hospitals from a heavy burden on uh, receiving too many patients um, in the emergency reception wards so this is the next step we are actually working with a with an American company to do this called Persone, uh, who are trying to produce a new platform. These uh, few tests uh, can be produced directly in the patient's home. And by we will uh, do uh, our algorithms by directly on these results. You can you can check the company uh, in uh, on the net. P E R S O W N dot com. That means personal ownership, which means that the patient can can uh, check his results himself or have something before intelligence is applied. Since risk, I think the uh, simple platform combined with the artificial intelligence to estimate the patient's risk and uh, condition. Brilliant. No, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, Adam, do you have anything to add on to patient appointments and AI? Not particularly, no. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe, no worries. Well, no maybe worries. I can tell you, I can tell you I, that we I have tried it. Of course, Sorry. Ellie, yeah. Um, with regards to uh, do not attend, um, we really need to focus on population health management uh, and target the, the specific areas where we know people don't regularly attend. So we've got to have the, that, again, going back to the data quality, uh, having a much better intelligence around population health management and how we're targeting um, those specific uh, groups of people who don't attend as well. We can pick up on a regular basis within the um, booking systems, those who don't attend, and we can pick up on GP practices, those who don't attend. But we've got to target as well those who, um, who, who don't even go to the GP practices. So AI will be useful for that in the future, but it comes back to data quality and population health management, and we need to be more intelligent around that. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I think, did Morton, did you have something to add on that, or, or Matt or Eleanor? I, I mean, I, I think that people's behavior is absolutely trackable through AI-based systems. Obviously, we have the data quality issue. At the same time, we have demographic data that will give us big picture thinking as to who is most likely, what age bands, what um, what po target populations, what postcodes, for instance, what comorbidities or lack of comorbidities. So I think all of this is um, is doable with the right data. Having said that, I haven't seen any published evidence in terms of big publications. Um, and you know, I think it'd be a really interesting question as we seek to drive and improve our efficiency of healthcare services. Fantastic. Brilliant. No, thank you guys for those answers. Brilliant. Um, I'm sure um, Molly would be very happy with those. Um, Actually, I've just got some information across the, the the sea between Denmark and UK saying that uh, we're actually having a project in UK where we are doing this risk stratification for no turnups every morning based on the historical data. So I think all, there is already a case that could be uh, beneficial for, for us. Brilliant. So, um, so it's, that's fantastic. Um, how would you kind of implement um, monitoring those kind of um, that data? And yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, if I can, if I can break it a bit here, because it has already been shown that artificial intelligence is much much better in. Uh, uh, 
analyzing a radiographic picture than a radiologist so better than pathologists in in uh, detecting cancer in a in a in a cut uh, what we what we have a problem we have a problem as you probably know the uh, agency of healthcare in the united states has just written a report uh, on of some 700 pages saying that the, the one of the big in, in healthcare in the united states is uh, errors that's errors they have more than they claim that a, an average emergency reception board in the united states kills 100 patients per year 100 patients per year simply because of errors they don't they don't detect that the patient is in life danger and i think we can uh, use ai to uh, reduce these errors to uh, much lower figures we have the same problem here we saw how many died in our hospital in our emergency receptions and uh, they are pretty scaring uh, figures so uh, ai is first and foremost i think a uh, safety net for doctors not to do errors so that's the uh, purpose we are following mostly uh, safety for patients Thank you very much, Yvonne, for that answer. Um, I'd like to actually bring it back to Eleanor, if that's all right. Um, so, Eleanor, what do you think the future roles of AI in cancer diagnosis and management is? Um, so, I think at the, the moment, um, a lot of the AI algorithms are sort of um, based on the sort of the things that we can assess. But with AI, there's the capacity to sort of um, see a, a lot of things and, and analyze details that maybe that, that um, we can't sort of perceive as, as pathologists. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, taking a, a next step in terms of what we, so when we look at the glass slide, we can make the basic diagnosis, but what other information can we potentially extract from the, the features in terms of, for example, presence of genetic changes um, or other molecular changes that we can't necessarily perceive with the naked eye, but um, AI algorithms may be able to develop patterns to, to sort of um, to do that. So um, I guess one potential example would be there's um, drugs that are recently been approved um, called PARP inhibitors that are specifically for patients that have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And that's going to lead to a, a big increase in, in testing, um, which will put a, a strain on the genomic medicine hub. So if we could find some way of looking at the characteristics of the tumour as a way of being a predictor as to which patients are most likely to, to carry those mutations, then that will again allow us to sort of streamline the process and prioritise tests to the, the patients that are, are most likely to have a, a positive result. So I think the next step is a bit of sort of what Ivan's alluded to, I guess, is um, using these algorithms to extract information that, that we can't detect as, as humans and, um, you know, perhaps predict things like genetic changes and, and those sorts of things to make sure that patients are getting the right treatment and doing that in a more efficient manner. So I hope that answers the question. No, 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 definitely. Um, I, I could see Matt and Elaine absolutely nodding, nodding away there. Um, do you guys have anything to bring in on that one? Only, only, I mean, a fantastic answer from the diagnostics perspective. I guess yeah. I would bring this back as, an, as a non-oncologist and non-pathologist to populations and what we can do from an AI perspective signal and indicate when patients should present to a clinician with worrying symptoms. And you know, if we look at good outcomes versus bad outcomes from cancer and a variety of really serious illnesses, it's about the lateness of presentation more often than not. And that goes across acute conditions and chronic conditions as well. So the question, I suppose, is what is the algorithm from a population perspective that will tell a person, the general public, when they should go and seek help, when they should not go and seek help, when they should not worry, and when they should worry? And, you know, this is within our grasp question is what sort of size of database we will need to answer the question and what sort of systems we will be able to put in place that are ethically sound but allow patients to have improved outcomes and start overcoming the inequalities of healthcare that exist across this country and many others 
where the rich do well and the poor do very poorly. So the question is, it is a bigger one, I think, than just diagnostics. It's about how we influence population health to improve the, the, the welfare of the entire country. I absolutely agree with that. We need to address diagnostics the way I can support that, how it can address uh, patient-initiated follow-up, follow how AI can address that and support virtual consultations, all of those things we've been talking about for the last five years. How can we make it, how can we make AI support that uh, and be appropriate uh, and reduce unwarranted variation across the country that we have at the moment? Absolutely fantastic answers. Yeah. Uh, if I, I mean, Adam, even if you, if how, how do you think digital and IT can add to that at all? Um, so my perspective is procurement of um, artificial intelligence. So it's uh, interesting sort of hearing now that the maturity of some of these solutions, but I, I'm, um, you know, keen to, to sort of help uh, innovators and startups with sort of navigating the, the NHS um, procurement landscape. Um, I don't know if any of the panel members have any sort of thoughts on on challenges challenges there and how we can overcome them. Not sure. On that. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe I can add. Yeah, uh, based on I our experience, it. even the way we started was actually that we 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 have developed the hospital and says this AI hospital, which is a concept actually for starting describing a use case which could be which a use case could be uh, show offs and then actually describe the value behind that case and then get access to data described which says you need and then start developing your modeling and test validate and actually at the end set this into production and build up establish an organization around this because what is actually happening at the Lillebelt hospital right now is that they will be having their own AI organization. They will be having their own data scientists. And they will not only be doing one use case, they will be doing several. Of course, we will be supporting them, but actually they will be doing it them by themselves because now they know how to start and how to govern uh, an AI project. Brilliant. I, I wonder yeah. if the question's one of you know, maybe it goes back to the data quality question again and again, you know, for population health, size, you know, the, the big limitation on all of our advances in AI and a variety of other different avenues is the fact that our interoperable digital systems are not fit for purpose um, from a clinical care perspective mm. across this country. Yeah. And, you know, we have regional exemplars, but we certainly don't have national. And the question, all of the AI answers lie within the data. So, our big priority is improving the quality of that data and the standardization, the use of interoperability to actually get them and to form a proper trusted research environment for the population. If we can get that, that will enable us to leap further with AI than anything else. I think. Yeah. May I comment on Elaine's uh, very good comment? Um, uh, looking for structures that just reflect uh, uh, structures is not the answer. We need better information. Uh, we need dynamic information from, uh, from samples, from uh, slides, from a digital pathology. And I think, and we have discussed it here, that we want to combine it with the biochemical dynamic information, which means that we can actually measure the um, the turnover intracellularly of the dna replication we have just that it may be a couple of years ago in braf mutations and where we can measure the changes in pathway proteins and we are pursuing that goal at the moment because that really shows not dynamically but we need to combine that with the uh, anatomic pathology uh, results, and we want to expand that uh, and use it in uh, in uh, uh, in AI applications. The problem is we, we cannot see things that we don't know are there, so we still need a lot of research to come to what Elaine wants to achieve. 
Uh, at the moment, we are working on this uh, problem on uh, prostatic cancer, and uh, because we have a big problem there in in forecasting the the risk from this prostatic cancer, and and we have to develop new tools for that. So AI cannot just be applied on the data we have new. It must go hand in hand with the, with development of new uh, variables, new data data and we need to ask the right questions to answer this and develop the new data and at the same time we also have to reorganize we now the whole uh, the whole infrastructure of uh, she in our hospitals because they are much too slow they are very good for reactive uh, surveys and reviews and so on and statistics but what we have now is a situation where we want to use AI in a predictive way now. Re uh, digital expert systems are so real time, not yesterday. So, so we have to make data flow in our systems, which they do not do automatically right now. So how would you encourage that, Ivan? Um, how would you help clinicians sort of adopt that, that, that side of AI? Uh, well, I have made a lot of uh, uh, departments. Three years, I always, I almost gave up because everybody uh, was very resistant and didn't understand that we actually needed to, uh, to uh, do things faster and, uh, and smarter and with less hands because uh, it, it, the healthcare sector was becoming a bigger and bigger burden. And it was only when they felt it like three years ago or so that they had more work than they had hands that they, uh, that they uh, received it with, uh, with, with joy, I would say. And we are working very closely with our doctors to achieve this. And they are not against it anymore. We are just writing up a paper to, with them to, to uh, present this work and, and the new approaches of handling patients. We are going from retrospective to risk calculations uh, after the patient was received and so on to actually predict now what is wrong with the patient and how will it end up unless we do something. So the new job for my one of my PhD students who is now a professor in cardiology said to me, well, it's very good. You can tell me that this patient's risk of dying within the next seven days is 95%. But my question is, can I do something or should I do something? And that's the next question too, when you start using artificial intelligence, because it can make predictions on risk and uh, status for the patients, but um, can't heal the patient. It can't deliver healthcare. That's a doctor's job. No, that's fantastic. Um, so we've, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'd just like to um, just take a final word from all of our panelists, if that's all right, on what the future of AI would be and the future of diagnostics and where you can see it going. Um, Morton, if I can start with you, that would be fantastic. Uh, I think the last 60 minutes shows that we need AI, but uh, we need to be aware of all the uh, the stuff actually around uh, doing the AI modeling. So uh, this is not doable without looking at your organization. Are you having the right competences? Are you having the right governance? And actually, I think the case shows that you need to have leadership on board. You need to have, uh, to have top management saying this is actually the way going forward and we are behind you. Uh, and that's what's happening at, at uh, Ireland's Hospital right now. So top management needs to be involved, need to find budget or seek for budget so that we can uh, continue this journey. Fantastic, thank you, Morten. Uh, Eleanor? I'm muted. Oh, we go. Thank there you. you go. No worries. <laughs> Back online. Um, so I, I think it's a very, for me as a pathologist, and it's an incredibly exciting time to be working in pathology with the introduction of digital pathology and as an extension of that, the implementation of, of AI. I think what it's really going to do is... Um, a lot of the, the jobs we do are, are fairly mundane, things like 
counting we we're talking about biomarkers before and can probably be done much better by a, a machine than, than we can do it um, anyway and it's going to free up our time to focus on, on more challenging cases so I think it's going to um, enable us to work more efficiently and for the pathologists and the human doctors to focus on some of the more challenging areas and the AI will take care of some of the more mundane counting you know type jobs that that we do and then as I mentioned previously and there was also a question about this it's um extracting more information from these basic H&E slides and um I think in the short term it's going to be triaging rather than replacing the, the genetic tests but um, providing a lot more information than we as pathologists can provide so I think there's a, a huge amount of research it's growing exponentially and it's a very um, exciting time to be working in healthcare. No, fantastic thank you Eleanor. Um, Adam I know you come from the procurement side of things but um, have you got any thoughts on the future of AI in, um, in the NHS? Yeah. I I, th I think it's sort of the success is, is about the adoption. So I, I think, you know, there's so much that it can do in terms of efficiencies and workforce and improving and automating. Um, but I think the key aspect in terms of being able to sort of properly adopt it is looking at how it sits alongside existing technologies within platforms and um, the governance around that as well. I think that, that, that you know, it's, it's possible that you could get all kinds of different sort of systems installed uh, and then they sort of become unsupported or, or difficult to manage so it's important that sort of the, the IT estate is built with this in mind and, and that it has appropriate governance and been able to incorporate these types of solutions going forward. Amazing, brilliant, nice one Adam. Um, Matt? I, mean, I, I think it's a really exciting time as others have said. Um, I think we have to think about the augmentation it brings to clinical decision making and patient care Clinicians have to be involved in how they're developed and they need to lead the change. It doesn't have all the answers, but it's a good, it, it will potentially assist. The marriage between what we, we gain from AI together with clinical experience is really important. After all, if you were critically ill, would you really want to be treated by a machine? Um, and I think the, the most important elements of, of bringing in the empathic, the gray areas, the clinical experience areas, there will always be a need for a human clinician within this for a, a number of different reasons. But what we need to be better at doing is thinking about how we marry AI to ensure that they are properly supported for all the reasons our, our panelists have said. That's fantastic, brilliant. Yeah. Elaine? Yeah, I can't tell you how excited I into di diagnostics, not only just for number one, earlier diagnosis and faster diagnosis, um, giving the the right test at the right time and not just you know a vast amount of tests uh, the patient going forward but just um, making sure that we are uh, productive in the tests that we offer the patients as well but secondly optimizing the patient to go home and support them um, uh, to enable them to live a life if they are diagnosed uh, at third or fourth stage um, we can we can support them much better with AI um, technologies at home as well. Amazing. Thank you, Elaine. And finally, Ivan. Oh, yes. Well, a crucial point is, of course, now we have shown that AI can predict a lot of things. It can also predict that a patient is outside, so a patient can be sent home, which is just as important when you talk about efficiency and effectivity in the healthcare sector, so they don't uh, stress the uh, but but of course the important thing is if we do a control trial use not in uh, emergency reception areas will it actually help will it decrease uh, uh, this length of stay uh, the re um, the rehospitalization process uh, decrease the number of deaths within the next months or so uh, that is a question and we have to train the doctors now together with the clinical doctors to get acquainted to the system and learn to work with it and then we have to see whether it will change the outcome for patients if ai is not going to do that we have no amazing well brilliant thank you everyone thank you so much for giving up your time we really do appreciate it 
Um, I saw there was absolutely loads of questions in the in the chat, and I'm re I do apologise for not getting around to them. Um, but if you have any um, questions, please email them into uh, events at cognitivepublishing.com. I'll pop something down in the live chat, and please tell me who you'd like them to go to, and then I will forward them on for you. Um, but yeah, amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for giving up your time, and I'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.